I ask her to speak to us today about House Bill 4098 because she is the sponsor of this 400-page bill that was filed at the end of session. The bill amends the Illinois Pension Code, makes changes to Tier 2, uh, benefits for members or participants under the five state funded retirement systems and the Chicago Teachers Pension Fund, including changes to automatic annual increases, etc. As was mentioned, uh, I am the new chair of the Pensions Committee in the Illinois House. Uh, I am a policy person, so I'm not a lawyer. So this is kind of in my wheelhouse with regards to policy. The bill is about 400 pages long, but keep in mind that a lot of, when we talk about bills, a lot of the language is repetitive. As was mentioned, this is, this is going to apply, hopefully, it, it is a rough draft, but it's going to apply to the five pension systems, therefore things have to be re repeated five times. So while it seems voluminous, I know everybody likes to throw that out there, uh, pretty much it's, it, it, it's just uh, changing things in the different codes in which it will be. So. With the wonderful presentation on Safe Harbor, as we noticed and as was mentioned in the presentation, Safe Harbor affects the higher wage earning individuals uh, that make over the amount that was listed, which right now in tier two is 119,000. So this would affect those in the categories of above 119,000 and 160 for the most part. Um, and as we are working through this pension system, I am diligent and, and we are working really hard and I want you all to be diligent to remind the general public that the annuitants do not get Social Security. Uh, there is always misinformation out there and sometimes more misinformation than we can combat, but to continually remind the public and uh, through maybe even letters to the editor or, or some kind of outreach, the truth is that this is the retirement plan for our university professors, our college instructors, our teachers, and um, many police and, and those likes, they don't get Social Security. And I think that uh, while to us it's common knowledge to, to the other individuals in the state of Illinois, the millions that receive Social Security, they don't understand that, nor do they comprehend that. So. I, I have one ask of you is to be diligent about informing the public and your friends and individuals that you do not receive Social Security. This is your only retirement. I do have to say that we have uh, new leadership in the Illinois House, if you didn't notice. Um, and I believe it's because of this new leadership um, and uh, myself as the chair of pensions, we work very well together and uh, Speaker Welch is very committed very committed to solving the tier two issue and creating a solution for those that give their time and effort and energy to the state of Illinois. We appreciate you and this is something that has been percolating and simmering for way too long and, and we, he has given me his word that we are committed to finding this solution. So I just wanted to put that out there. As was mentioned, this bill was filed in the last uh, days of session. Why would that be? The reason is because we are gonna work on this Throughout uh, the, the summer, we're looking at the committee getting, you know, availability. People do have vacations. Uh, through the, maybe towards the end of July, August, September, October to flush out and to get a plan, hopefully for veto session, to be uh, well vetted. So, as you know, some of you might not know, but session is very busy with a lot of bills coming through flying at warp speed. And uh, we thought a bill of this magnitude we did work on it during session. We had hours upon hours of subject matter hearings on tier two, on safe harbor, on fixes, on adjustments. So our committee worked through the session to present this bill at the end of session as the work of all our subject matter hearings. And now over the summer, we are gonna look at it, revise it, adjust it, have hearings on it, have hearings on the Siegel report, have hearings on the SURS report, have multiple hearings with a lot of riveting testimony that you all can tune in on, uh, ILGA.gov. Tune in, you'll love it. it. It drones on and on and on. Um, so what is in House Bill 4098? Four, House Bill 4099 is the overarching bill. House Bill 4099 specifically looks at parity with regards to our 
pretty much our university police, those in the public safety sphere, correctionals, and that sort of like. So, And we did include Chicago Teachers Pension Fund in this as well uh, because they are a very, very important pension fund. The state uh, does have you know, some jurisdiction over it. And uh, as uh, I've been reminded and I've known very well, is that the Chicago Teachers Pension Fund had a dedicated revenue source until back in, I believe, the 1990s, the state of Illinois granted the mayor of Chicago the uh, authority to commingle that dedicated revenue source on the promise that he would pay their pensions, and he did not. <laughs> it seems to be an overarching theme in the, in the state of Illinois history. And, uh, and I have to say that the members of the 103rd General Assembly are bound and determined not to repeat the ills of the past with regard to our pensions. So what are we talking about with regards to House Bill 4098? Uh, you can read all 400 pages if you so choose on ILGA.gov, but I will give you a brief um, overview right now. So we are calling this our Tier 2 Pension Package. And we are looking at it, as was mentioned, to look at the changes to Tier 2 for the five state funded pension systems plus Chicago Teachers Pension Fund to be equal to the Social Security wage base. And we're, we are looking at, and this is of course, uh, keep in mind, this is all um, proposals. This can all change. So this is at least something in writing that's a proposal, but right now we were looking at over uh, smoothing it over an eight year period, which means that we will raise that amount in eighth and eighth and eighth and eighth up until we reach the Social Security cap in eight years. Um, we, that, of course, can be adjusted through our deliberation on this bill, but that's our, our starting marker. Changes to the Tier 2 automatic annual increases. So right now, uh, it is CPI uh, or 3%, wh whatever is, is less. Um, and so what we are looking at, or one half of CPI, sorry, it's one half of CPI or 3%, whatever is less. So what we are looking at is going to the greater of 3% or one half of CPI, but rolling that over a three year average. Budgetarily wise, if we roll it, it helps with the budget. It keeps the, the payments more manageable than spiking it up if CPI goes very high and then it drops back down. And this is a better method. Uh, it's been expressed this is a better method for the annuitants as well, because then they won't get a big increase and it, it, it will just smooth it out a little bit over that three year rolling average. Again. These are proposals. This might not be in the final version. There is a thing called amendments, and those that are in Springfield know that amendments fly quite easily in the state of Illinois. So, uh, But again, that is the proposal with this. Um, we would expand the pension buyouts uh, to the General Assembly, judges' articles, SIRS, uh, SURS, and TRRS. Funding for the buyouts, we are looking at the state pension obligation acceleration bonds that were already issued. Uh, so for uh, the new buyouts uh, for GARS and JRS, uh, because the state can't retroactively change the use of the bond proceeds, the funding is set to come from the general revenue fund with regard to GRS and JRS. Uh, the sunset for the program is right now June 30th, 2026, which we will look at as well. Uh, currently in this as well is the closure of GARS and JRS, the General Assembly Retirement System and the Judges Retirement System. The history between these two funds is, is simply more perks for us, less perks for others. Um, the GARS and the judges had lavishly more pension um, giveaways, for lack of a better word, than the average individual had. Under the 2011 Tier 2 Pension Program, of which, as was mentioned, I came in in 2013, uh, under the 2011 Tier 2, that was all um, level. So there are no additional perks, and we don't want to allow for individuals to think that they can, as a General Assembly member or judge, get additional perks down the future. So what this does is it closes GARS and JRS and allows members of these two subsections to participate in SERS. Uh, the state employee retirement system. That also, as was mentioned here, individuals such as myself, uh, we do pay into Social Security. A lot of individuals have 
uh, other lines of business before they get elected or before they become judges. This also maintains their Social Security benefit because SERS, in general, without a small subsection, uh, maybe 10 or 20 percent of that subsection is uh, do not get Social Security benefits. But the vast majority of SERS participants get Social Security, and it just seems like the right thing to do. So that's what's in this bill as well. It also extends a drop plan. So this drop plan is extended to these systems. A drop plan is a deferred retirement option program, and we're looking at instituting a drop plan for the last five years of employment. Simply stating, if you've worked you know, 30 years and you have five more years left, then what you can do is you can freeze your pensionable retirement at that 30 year mark and divert your last five years of your payments and match into a 457 plan so you can buy that house in the Bahamas so you can have immediate cash available for whatever you choose uh, that can help out right when you retire. Uh, it's up to five years, it's voluntary. You can take all five years, you can take three years, you can take two years. If you wanna um, buy a big mobile home that costs $100,000, you know, you can budget that as the way that you want to in your retirement. But this gives an option with regards to retirement plan and, a, and it's called a drop plan. So it allows you to plan a little bit better for your retirement. Again, these are all proposals and uh, I'm gonna keep saying that. I'm not a lawyer, but I just feel like I should. <laughs> uh, also, this is also was proposed back in the day under former representative Mike Fortner. When we looked at the bond schedule, uh, we have two bonds that are coming due that are gonna be paid off in 2031 and 2033. And so what this legislation does is takes those bond payments, a total of a billion dollars a year, and puts that towards our unfunded liability. And that will start lowering that unfunded liability. It's the same concept as when you pay off your car, then you shift that $400, $500 payment to your credit card debt. So it's still baked into your budget. You're not changing anything, but you're just shifting that payment to pay down the debt. So, and then what we're also doing to get the full 20 years is we're extending that rate to 2050, an extra five years, so we get a full 20 years of that $20 billion. In addition to that, we're changing the funding uh, target from 90% to 100%. So that's in this plan as well, this additional funding. On the back end, we still need additional funding on the front end, and our, and our committee's gonna look at it, as was mentioned with the Siegel, $5.6 billion, roughly $300 million a year. The governor put in an additional $200 million in this budget, $300 million in the last budget. But the committee and myself included, going back to that example in, uh, with the Chicago Teachers Retirement Fund, um, it is our desire to have a dedicated revenue source so that it's not willy-nilly, let's throw $300 million or $200 million or $100 million or, or a, a rough number that is at the whim of, of the budgeteers or the governor or the General Assembly. So we're looking at and trying to identify dedicated revenue sources that would be lockboxed solely for pension systems. This has worked. Uh, Cook County did this. They raised their sales tax and lockboxed that $100 million a year, and their pensions are, are now very strong, and they're doing a great job of it. So. We know that one of the solutions for our pension systems is additional funds on the front end. We've identified funds at the back end, and that's gonna be a win-win on both sides. So we're looking at that. Uh, finally, we are looking at uh, the differences between the funding formula and the actuarial. As I mentioned, when we're moving that target, the actuarial number is that 100% number. So right now, you know, we're, we're quote unquote shorting 4.5 billion dollars in our payment. What we're actually doing is we're just aiming for that 90% mark, that's the difference. So by going to 100%, we're going to be making then the actuarial payment that needs to be made based on that assumption. Finally, in looking at the retirement age, it was mentioned 67 and 10. Well, this bill changes that. Hold your applause, I know you're kind of happy about that. So what we're looking at is changing those retirement ages 
to uh, retire at 62 with 35 years of service, 64 with 20 years of service, and 67 with 10 years of service. So we're keeping the 67 at 10, which I think makes sense. But we're also giving credit where credit's due. And if you put in 35 years of service, God bless you. <laughs> and, uh, and we should account for that. So we are doing that as well. Uh, looking at that scale, again, it's proposed. We will be having hearings with regards to that. That will increase the cost. All these will increase the cost, just to keep that in mind. Finally, there was um, a Tier 3 system that was passed. It was never implemented. Uh, this bill rescinds that Tier 3 and just wipes it out of the books. And then, um, and then, we, and then there's some language in some laws, uh, specifically with Chicago um, police pensions that needs a five-year renewal. It's ridiculous. It's been in the books since like 1967. We're just going to eliminate that language because it doesn't really affect you guys, but that's just, we're going to be doing some cleanup language, finding these old nuggets of information from the 60s and the 70s that don't always apply, and we're going to be doing some cleanup language with regards to that. So um, that is the nutshell. I am, as was mentioned, the analysis looks um, is, is, is quite lengthy, but that's kind of the overview, the, what do they say, 64,000 level overview of some of the changes, and then uh, that also allows for about 20 minutes of question and answers. I would uh, assume, uh, please don't stand up and pontificate your vision of the world, um, uh, because lunch awaits, and I, I would hate to have a lunch riot here. But, um, but definitely, we are committed to solving this problem. The speaker is committed to solving the problem. I have been in conversations with the Senate counterpart, uh, represent, uh, Senator Martwick, and um, hopefully, uh, and uh, the good Lord willing, we will have a, a formidable, workable piece of legislation that everybody can be proud of, that the bond, house, bond houses approve of, and that puts us on a path to finally solve this problem that's been plaguing the state of Illinois for now over a decade. I think it's great to reach out to representatives. As I said before, it's really important to educate the public on what we're talking about here as well. Um, and if there are specific uh, examples, such as what was just mentioned about the older employees, you know, or if there's specific examples that you might know of that myself or the individuals I'm working with might not be aware of these nuances that we should look at, now is the time to bring them up. Now is the time for us to, uh, you know, my goal is, is you know, you take the shot and you get the target. So this is my one shot, and we want to make sure that it hits the target, and it, it does, and it hits the target, and uh, encompasses some of these little nuances as well, such as the older employees and their second careers and stuff like that. So I urge you collectively to think uh, and to let me know uh, if there are these small issues that you might have experienced or you know people that have experienced that just doesn't doesn't rise up to the big discussion when we're talking about the huge enchilada of pensions here's the reality and and in the world of misinformation and twisting and and uh, the like the there is this uh, I call it the false 401k mantra or or a string of thought and let's just say it what it is, is it's, it's false. Uh, people believe that number one, 401ks are this wonderful retirement plan. Well, I was a former registered financial advisor with Morgan Stanley, and I saw a woman who had a 401k plan that was overburdened in a, in a certain large company, and I won't say the name. And this large company was at $40 a share. And I told her, as a financial advisor, she had to disinvest from this company that she worked in. She was overburdened with that amount of stock in her 401k, and she didn't listen to me. And that $40 a share, when she came to retirement, went all the way down to $6 a share. So morally, morally, pensions are retirement security. 
It's not a retirement account. It's a retirement security because we respect those that work for us. We would like them to have a solid retirement. Now, of course, that woman did have her Social Security, as we talked about before, but when you see a 401k plan just collapse like that because of uh, unsuspecting or unknowledgeable investor or somebody that believes that I've worked for this company for 30 years, they'd never let me down. They're not going to let you down. They might let you down. Um, the fallacy of the 401k line of reasoning is we could just snap our fingers and put everybody into a 401k, uh, which is poppycock. Um, what we have, as we've mentioned before, we have tier one retirees, or gonna be retiree, that are owed their pension. And they are, and it's a pay it forward system, similar to social security. The new individuals are paying into the system and they are then supporting it for the retirees and as they pay it forward, it, that's how the system works. So we have to pay for them. Now we have the current tier two individuals that are in the tier two system right now. And then we have the future employees. So if we're going to make a change to 401k, then we have to, based on law, uh, do it for new employees only. Because we cannot, uh, based on the pension protection clause of the Constitution, we cannot diminish or, or eliminate pensions of those that are in it. If we take that clause out of the Constitution, then we flip everybody into a 401k. And that, but then we also put everybody into Social Security. Now, number one, the federal government might not like that very much. <laughs> because now we are, and then number two, the people that are already retired, we will still have to pay for those benefits. And then if we still maintain the pension protection clause, we'd have to pay for the benefits of the current employees too. But now we have to put in an added payment above and beyond what we're paying to the federal government for our social security match. So in essence, it would cost extremely more to the state to sit there and maintain this fallacy of a 401k mentality. Now, this is where Minority Spokesperson Reich is on this bill because he said, and he said in committee, we are no longer considering that fallacy. Of a, he doesn't say fallacy, that's my word. <laughs> but he is saying that we need to fix the pension systems where we're at and we need to stop talking about this 401k. Uh, mentality, which is uh, a complete fallacy. It just won't work because this is your retirement. This is concurrent with Social Security. So it would cost the state a lot more. And morally, the state believes that you deserve a secure pension when you retire, and that's the right thing to do. Anybody else? It's 11:37. I'm scheduled to 11. Correct. I have been working with IEA and IFT, and um, really working with TRS and getting information from SURS. As you said, the, the actuarials just came back. Um, that bill. What we need to get is a bill that will pass and that is manageable. I know that that bill had half a CPI or 3% whatever is greater and it had, um, and again, these bills are our starting points. So we started with that bill and working with the governor's office and working with TRS and working with IFT and working with IEA, you know, we, we boiled it down. Of course, it's in the Senate. It was not in the House. So we didn't have a subject matter of it in the Senate, but I had to have discussions about it. And again, this is a starting point as well. So we might all go back and look at that bill and see where we can get agreement on. But uh, at the end of the day, as those that read cap facts read a lot, at the end of the day, we want to get 60 or more in the House, 30 votes in the Senate and the governor to get on board with it. And, uh, and that's going to take negotiation. It's not going to be this bill and that bill. It's going to be something that most likely is going to be a compromise bill that won't have everything, but will have uh, the, the fix that and it also, we were looking at the bond houses. Illinois has gotten eight credit upgrades. So we have to look at if provisions in that bill 
would cause the bond houses to be a little bit leery or not, and we also have to look at other bills. So there's a lot of moving components with regard to this subject matter, but I have the long end and the short end is yes, all those bills have been under consideration and discussion. Because I have that much of fun in my life. <laughs> This is what I do for fun. I know some of you are, are really so sorry for me now. <laughs> or happy that this is my life so that you guys can, uh, so that we hopefully get a, but again, we need to keep the, the financial balance budgets um, given some other states. Illinois is a great place to be right now, and I think that we need to really appreciate that as well. Thanks for watching, and if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to our channel. And while you're at it, please leave us a comment. Thank you for watching.